Hey everybody, welcome back to Organic Chemistry. My name is Todd Rothman and in this video we're going to start to learn about carboxylic acids and their derivatives. So at this point I'm assuming that you went through the class 1 reactions which is the aldehyde and ketones. So that was our first set on carbonyl chemistry. This is our second. Remember there are four total chapters on carbonyl chemistry. This is the second of the four. So what we're going to do in this chapter is we're going to focus our attention exclusively on, well for the most part, we're going to focus our attention on carboxylic acid and derivatives. Okay, we, as just like with the aldehyde and ketone, sometimes you see class 2, and in this case sometimes we'll see class 1. Now at the end of this, we're going to start wrapping everything up together and starting to organize both class 1 and 2, but that's after we're done with this chapter. Now I want to emphasize that this video, just like with the class 1, this video is very important because it's going to set us up. It's going to give us the foundation that we work from. So this video is going to help us understand the philosophy behind class 2 reactions. It, ex it gives us like the, the basis to work from. And it's really important that you build this foundation. I, I, I'm assuming if you watch the class 1 videos, aldehyde and ketone, you, you realize the value in learning the general mechanism before you go into detail, right? And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to learn the general ideas and we're going to understand the, the principles behind them. Now, what I want you to do, realize is that, and why it's so important that you understand class 1 before you start class 2, is because when you're learning class 2, you're going to see a lot of the similar or, or identical nucleophiles. So I want you to think, okay, if this was a class 1, what would it have done? So water or alcohol with a class 1 does something very, very different than with a class 2 molecule. And I want you to start to make those neural connections, make those uh, differentiations in your mind. See, okay, so when I have a class 1, it does this, but when I have a class 2, it does that. It's very important that you can do that. On your test, when you finally hit the exam, you're going to have to look at a molecule, quickly identify its characteristic, 1 or 2, class 1 or class 2, and then kind of work from there as to what potentially can happen, right? So it's good that you start thinking in that point of view. So whenever we learn something new, I want you to take a moment in your, to yourself and think, how does that relate to class 1? What would, have cl what would class 1 had done if it was it reacting instead of a class 2? All right, now that's enough of a quick introduction. Now here's what we're going to do. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about the order of reactivity. So remember, there's a lot more class 2 than class 1. So we have to understand how that order works, and we're going to learn some important things about that. Uh, then we're going to talk about leaving groups, and we'll see why general summary. This is our master summary card, which you'll see in a few. And then finally, we'll talk about the three specific mechanism, uh, mechanistic points that you need to understand. Now this is all independent of the nucleophile type. We're just going to learn more generic ideas now and we'll learn about the details after this video. Okay, let's get started. So here's the first thing to keep in mind. The order of reactivity and of course, remember class 2 and again, I'm assuming that you already did the the first video set for uh, aldehydes and ketones, but as a reminder, a class 2, a class Two is when Z, whatever Z is, some kind of group here, is more electronegative than carbon. So there's a lot of those. So with the class 1, that's what makes up a class 2. Class 1, we said Z is equal or less electronegative than carbon. But for class 2, Z, whatever that atom is touching the carbonyl carbon, it is more electronegative, right? And so we see that with a halogen, with an oxygen, a sulfur, an oxygen, an oxygen and a nitrogen. Those are all class 2's. They're atoms that are more electronegative. Now it turns out that the trend of reactivity is going in the direction where the acyl halide, meaning a halogen on the carbonyl carbon, that is the most reactive. Chlorine or bromine, okay? So halogens on a carbonyl carbon. Next up is called an acid anhydride. And that's where we have a carbonyl that's touching a carboxylic acid group. So notice how the left carbonyl is touching an O that's part of a carboxylic acid, right? This right here is a COO group. So that's 
that's uh, called an acid anhydride. All right, that's the second most reactive. Following that is the thioester. That's a sulfur, similar to ester, but a sulfur. Oh, by the way, thioester is not what I have here. This is SH. It should be SR. It could be SH as well, okay? SH as well, but that's not called a thioester. That's a, that's a thio carboxylic acid. So a thioester is where it's SR. And I'll leave it there because thioesters are actually the ones that we care about uh, for this section here. Um, not to say that you couldn't have a thio carboxylic acid, but um, well, actually, I mean, you could. So I'll, I might as well leave it in here. Although it's just not very common that you'll speak about it. Um, but anyway, there it is. So thio carboxylic acid is another one. And then finally, uh, down below on the next level is the ester. And notice how it's equal in reactivity to the carboxylic acid. Just like the thioester is equal to the thio carboxylic acid. So that's a very common trend. And we'll learn why as we go on later on. But those are equal. Now remember, this is increasing reactivity going up to the left, right? Go and look at my arrow on the left. So it's going up. So now the next one up is the carboxylic acid after the ester, which I should say they're equal in energy. And then finally below that is the amide. And the amide is the one that is the least reactive of all of these. You have to know this trend. Not, not so much the thiocarboxylic acid, I just kind of add that in now. Uh, because it is it is in there, but I don't, I don't think we see that often until chapter 18. But anyway, there it is. Now, I want to show you that this is increasing reactivity. So no surprise, working down this way, this is increasing in stability, right? So stability is the opposite of reactivity, right? So the amide is the most stable and therefore the least reactive. Now, what's going on with this reactivity stuff? Well, it's very much the same as what we talked about with our class one. We're going to have a nucleophile that needs to make its way into this position. And what we're looking for, here's Z, and what we're looking for is we want to have a carbon that's most positive. More positive the carbon is, remember this is partial negative, the more positive this carbon is, the more that this nucleophile is going to find it. It's going to get in there quicker. And there's another new group, a new idea, which has to do with this Z. So there's also that, the leaving potential of this plays an important role. So remember for class one and class two, um, sorry, class one aldehyde ketone, we said there were two factors. There was the steric issue, and then there was how positive is the carbonyl carbon. Th well, we have one in common. We have the positive carbon concern. We also have steric. I mean, that's always a concern. But there's a new idea, a leaving group. So it really comes down, if we want to summarize, into three things to consider. The how good is the partial positive carbon? How strong is it? The second thing is, okay, we might as well add steric factors, right? So we want to make sure that a nucleophile can get into the carbonyl. And then the third thing, which is new, is leaving group potential for Z. These are the factors that will influence our decision and actually what make up this trend up here. Okay, so it turns out that the carbonyl carbon of an amide is the least positive. Now think about that. If you have, let's say, a carbonyl with a nitrogen on it, it doesn't matter if it has H's or not, by the way. So this amide could have H's on it, but it could also have carbons, one or two. It doesn't matter. It won't have three, because then it would be positive. But it could have one H or two H's, one carbon, two carbons, so on. So here's an amide. Now, when this goes to resonance and this goes up, think about what's happening. Well, this nitrogen is becoming positive, right? And now, if I consider that, let's say, same analysis with an oxygen, let's say, um, an OCH3, right? So then you have that. Or let's consider the acyl halide, which is kind of giving us a broad enough idea of what's going on here. Okay, so this is what we're dealing with, right? We have these different considerations, and this is positive. All right, now I want to point out that in all these cases, they all happen. They all have these resonance forms. Because remember, when a carbonyl carbon is positive, it's going to have resonance to help stabilize it, right? 
So these three all have resonance stabilization. And that's why, in general, they're not...